What if you could keep cutting a sheet of paper forever, smaller and smaller and smaller, all the way to microscopic levels? Would you eventually slice a molecule in half, then an individual atom in half? How far can you theoretically go? It sounds simple enough. We just take the sharpest scissors we can find, cut a piece of paper into tinier and tinier pieces, and keep going. Where do we end up? We know nature has rules, but where do those rules slam the door? What bonds can we actually break? You might be shocked to learn the answer. Today, we're going to follow a single cut all the way down and see where it stops. That fascinating story is coming up right now. First, you should know that paper isn't one smooth thing. It's a felt, like a tangled mat made of plant fibers primarily composed of cellulose. Zoom in and each fiber is a bundle of even smaller strands. And inside those strands are long molecular chains called polymers. Polymers are large molecules made of smaller repeating units. The repeating units in this case are glucose molecules linked together in a chain through covalent bonds. A covalent bond forms when electron orbitals of two atoms overlap and the atoms share electrons. This creates a lower energy stable connection between them and results in a strong chemical bond. But the fibers stick together mostly not because of covalent bonds, but thanks to hydrogen bonds, which are weak electrical attractions between neighboring OH or oxygen hydrogen groups on cellulose chains. This attraction happens because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. This means it pulls the electron density towards itself, leaving a slight positive charge on the hydrogen and a slight negative charge on the oxygen of a nearby group. The resulting electrical attraction is a hydrogen bond. There's also an even weaker kind of attraction helping the fibers cling together called van der Waals forces. These happen because electrons and molecules are always moving, creating tiny momentary changes. When two cellulose surfaces get very close, these temporary charges make them feel a slight pull towards each other. Each pull is extremely weak, but paper has so many contact points that all these tiny attractions add up. Van der Waals forces don't hold the paper together on their own, but they add a lot of extra cling. One more thing scissors must overcome as the crack moves forward. Think of those hydrogen bonds like Velcro, lots of tiny hooks holding surfaces together. By contrast, the strong covalent bonds inside a glucose unit, like the carbon-carbon bonds, are more like welded steel. And the weak van der Waals force would be like the faint static cling between clothes fresh from the dryer, disappearing the moment you pull them apart. Now, what happens when scissors cut? First, the two blades of the scissors overlap and clamp the sheet so it can't slide or slip away. But what does it actually cut? Intermolecular bonds? What about the molecules themselves? And does it cut atoms too? The answer comes down to one thing, energy. What do I mean by that? I'm gonna explain that in detail as we look at what the scissors do step by step. And if you have trouble following some of this, let me suggest Brilliant.org, our sponsor today, where you can brush up on concepts you might struggle with. For example, I recently started the programming and computer science learning path on Brilliant. This subject has not always come easy to me, but the first course pulled me in because it just went through the simplest of concepts, which is the idea of how to think in terms of code. It then gradually progressed to thinking in Python, then programming with variables, then all the way to computer science fundamentals and even how neural networks work. The visual and interactive lessons where I solve puzzles and am given clues when stuck really worked for me, and I think it will work for you too, whether you want to learn programming, math, science, tech, or logic. To learn for free and brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash arvinash, scan the QR code on screen, or click the link in the description. Brilliant is also offering Arvin Ash viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. You should really give it a try. Now let's look step-by-step step at what happens after the two blades of scissors clamp the piece of paper. As the blades slide past each other, they concentrate shear stress, which is a sideways force into a tiny zone where the blades overlap. 
that concentrated stress starts a crack at the edge of the paper and drives it forward like a zipper. In everyday language, the blades team up to bully the paper into failing along a very specific line. As the crack races ahead, it goes naturally along the easiest path. Most of the time, this path of least resistance is between fibers. The crack peels apart hydrogen bonds and other weak contacts between fiber surfaces. That's why cut edges often look fuzzy under magnification. The fibers get pulled and frayed and partially detached. Sometimes a wall of fiber itself splits into substrands. That again involves breaking hydrogen bonds between cellulose microfibrils inside the fiber. But when a fiber is truly severed across its thickness, some covalent bonds in cellulose, these are the strong chemical links in the chain, also snap. That creates fresh molecular chain ends right at the fracture surface. And this is where cutting paper indeed does cut molecules. A long cellulose molecule becomes two shorter cellulose molecules. So this indeed means that a molecule is cut. But to be clear, this only affects a tiny fraction of the molecules in the sheet. Most of the cutting still happens between fibers, that is, through the hydrogen bonds, not cutting covalent bonds through the fibers. If you keep chopping the scraps of paper smaller, you keep making new cracked surfaces. Each new surface means more fiber-to-fiber -fiber bonds are torn, and more cellulose chains are broken wherever a fiber is actually cut. But the crack has a bias. It would much prefer to thread its way between fibers and along planes of weakness rather than plow through every polymer chain. So you get confetti, then lint, then dust, which are still made of fibers and fragments. These are not free isolated molecules drifting around. They're still chunks of solid material built from many molecules. There's also a geometry limit. A scissor isn't infinitely sharp. Even for a very sharp, high-quality blade, the edge radius is thousands to millions of atoms across. Once your fragment's thickness is similar to or smaller than the thickness of the scissor's edge, the material tends to bend and smear instead of shearing cleanly. The cut turns into a crush rather than a precise molecular guillotine. So yes, cutting does break some covalent bonds in the fracture plane, but it won't reliably reduce the entire piece to individual molecules. To actually chop cellulose all the way down to smaller molecules like glucose, chemists use chemical reactions such as hydrolysis or enzymes, not kitchen scissors. So let's answer our original question, how far can the cut go? What bonds can scissors actually break? Let's think of this as a bond-breaking hierarchy. Van der Waals forces are the featherweights. They require less than one hundredth of an electron volt to pull apart. Hydrogen bonds are the lightweights. It only takes a few tenths of an electron volt to pull these bonds apart. Covalent bonds are the middleweights. It takes several electron volts to break a typical chemical bond. Scissors can concentrate enough stress along a crack front to break some of these covalent bonds. This happens wherever fibers are actually severed. But to go further than that, you'd have to start breaking nuclear bonds inside the atoms. These are the heavyweights. Binding energies are in the millions of electron volts per nucleon. That's a jump of about a million in energy scale compared to ordinary chemical bonds. Mechanical blades can't get into the ring. They can't even get into the arena. There are two main reasons for this. The first is geometry. An atom is roughly a tenth of a nanometer across. As I said earlier, even a sharp steel edge is thousands to millions of times larger in radius. You can't focus force on a single atom. You mash millions of atoms at once, and the material responds by cracking along its existing chemical bonds instead. Second is energy. Even if you could poke one atom perfectly, Scissors deliver nowhere near the energy density needed to split a nucleus. To cut an atom, you need things like ionizing radiation, particle beams, or nuclear reactions, which are completely different processes requiring high energy physics, not household tools. Now I'll tell you how this is done. But if you saw the movie Oppenheimer, you got a taste of how extreme that engineering is. So the journey from a paper sheet to confetti goes like this. 
The structure of the paper is a felt of fibers held together mostly by hydrogen bonds and mechanical entanglement. The scissors clamp the sheet and create shear stress, which drives a crack along the path of least resistance. The van der Waals forces and hydrogen bonds fall first, but some covalent bonds fail too, especially where fibers are actually cut. Then we hit a hard stop. Nuclei are off limits to scissors. But what if you did want to cut all the way, including an individual atom? How would you do it? Well, it can be done. We have the technology, but you wouldn't use scissors or any other tool made of ordinary matter. You'd need to deliver a tremendous amount of energy into a space smaller than the atom itself. And the only way humans have ever achieved this is by using high energy particles, that is protons, neutrons, or heavy ions accelerated to enormous speeds. In other words, to split an atom, you have to fire something into it with enough energy to destabilize its nucleus. This is what happens in a particle accelerator. These machines use powerful electrical fields to whip particles into a significant fraction of the speed of light, then aim them at a target. When a high-speed particle slams into a nucleus, the impact can knock it apart, rearrange its components, and create entirely new particles from all the energies. This process is called nuclear scattering, or nuclear fragmentation, and it's one of the main ways physicists study the structure of matter. Another way atoms are split is through nuclear fission, the process used in nuclear reactors. In fission, an incoming neutron is absorbed by a heavy nucleus, like uranium-235. The added neutron makes the nucleus unstable, and it breaks into two smaller nuclei, plus more neutrons. That splitting releases a huge amount of energy because the binding energy of the pieces is higher than the original. In both cases, the important thing is this. You're not cutting the atom the way you cut paper. You're overloading the nucleus with enough energy or enough instability that it ruptures on its own. You don't slice the nucleus, you destabilize it. And all of this happens under extremely controlled conditions using equipment the size of buildings, with shielding, vacuum chambers, magnetic confinement, cryogenics, and layers of safety protocols. Nothing about it resembles a mechanical tool slicing through a material. Nuclear splitting sits at the far end of physics, the frontier of high energies and tiny distances, way beyond anything that everyday tools can influence. Next time you make a crisp cut, remember, you're driving a microscopic crack through a forest of polymers, unzipping weak bonds, making strong ones at the edge, and leaving the atomic nuclei completely unfazed, then going high energy physics to cut beyond. Hope you learned something new. I'll see you in the next video, my friend.